I now have the privilege um, of introducing uh, Jack Negro. And Jack Negro is going to be moderating today's panel, uh, district school board panel. So Jack is the superintendent of Indigenous Education and Equity. And I'm going to read the whole thing today, OK, Jack? Yeah, you, I know, I know. Uh, the Superintendent of Indigenous Education and Equity at the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. He is the past superintendent uh, of curriculum at the Holton Catholic District School Board, which included responsibilities in equity and inclusive education, newcomer students, new teacher induction, and kindergarten. He is also the past co-chair of the Taro Equity and Inclusive Education Network, and was both a local and provincial EIE lead for the Ministry of Education in his previous role as education officer at the Toronto and Area Regional Office. Jack has held portfolios in parent engagement, leadership development, and NTIP for the Ministry of Education, and has also served as a private schools inspector, inspecting over 80 schools in both Ontario and China. Previous roles also include a teacher with the Toronto Catholic District School Board, a curriculum developer, and administrator with the Independent Learning Centre, and the director of the School University Partnerships Office in the B.Ed. program at OISE UT. Jack was recently also a Canadian also on a Canadian team engaged by the government of Trinidad and Tobago, my, my home country, uh, that was working on the renewal of their kindergarten and early childhood education program. He is also, most, most importantly, a very, very proud uh, adjunct professor here at York University. Please welcome Jack Negro. Uh, before I, I begin this panel, um, I want to let you know that um, for 11 years, we've had this conference. And Carl and I have been kind of, you know, the two, two consistent people at the table. But most recently, um, Excel and Vidya have taken over uh, really the nuts and bolts organization of this conference. And it has been the most successful conference ever. And I just want to recognize the efforts of Vidya and Excel. Vidya and Excel, can you please stand? Michelle is at the back. A lot of different people in the room. So I think it's important to begin this part of our conference today with a bit of a historical retrospective on uh, equity as it has existed in Ontario. And I'm talking about the recent past. Uh, most of you in the room will have been born at the time that uh, I'm going to start the, the history. And you'll begin to see um, kind of the evolution of the idea of equity in the province and how we've gotten to today. And so, um, so let's start with a few, a timeline. Let's see, how many people remember these events? Hold on. So, Bill Clinton was the president. Kim Campbell was our prime minister. Um, let's see. Okay, so Joe Carter hit the winning home run. <laughs> Jurassic Park was uh, top of the list for movies. Whitney Houston, boy, we miss Whitney. And the world, oh, there it is, okay. Well, what year is that? <laughs> Gave it away. 1993. And so, um, that, in 1993, we saw the emergence of PPM 119. And it was the race, the anti-racism and ethno-cultural ethno equity uh, PPM, Policy and Program Memorandum. And, and for those of you that aren't um, familiar with EduSpeak, uh, policies exist at three levels. They exist as laws, policy documents, and policy and program memoranda. And so this was the policy and program memorandum that said, you need to do certain things um, and think about certain things. And, and then we, had to, we went to the For the Love of Learning document in 1994 that had equity considerations within it, that trustees, educators, support, and support staff be provided with professional development on anti-racism. You'll see a very heavy anti-racism bent back in the 90s and that performance management process include measurable outcomes. Okay, so that's 1994. 1995, I got nothing. <laughs> um, 
there, and it, maybe it's symbolic that there's, it's kind of like a clean slate because there was a bit of an erasure of anything equity related in, uh, in policy and in legislation. And, and we remained that way pretty much, although we began to see some things creeping into curriculum around 2003 um, with the 2009 Equity and Inclusive Education Strategy. So, so this was kind of the beginning of the new discussion um, around equity and, and inclusive education in the province. Now, it was a strategy and not a policy. So what that means is that, you know, a lot of what was written in here, um, boards were asked to do, but were not actually mandated to do it. The only mandated thing that came out of this was a religious accommodation policy. So that was mandatory, and every board had to get one ready um, and, and, and did so. But everything else was uh, really up to school boards to determine uh, how, they would, how they would see that through. I remember um, the launch of this and, and being in a room with directors, actually, directors of education, and um, engaging in a conversation with uh, one of them, uh, saying, equity, not, not so much. Not, not our, not our, we're not too worried about it. We're from a small board. We don't have a lot of diversity in our board, so we're good. Uh, no funding attached. No funding attached to, to this. There was a small, small amount of funding attached to a network that was able to operate of equity leaders, but no significant funding. And the heavy emphasis, at least initially, was feeling safe and included. If you, if you think about some of the things that were happening back in the 2000s, there were, there were ugly things happening around feeling safe. So this was the focus. And, and in fact, um, you'll see that, that when funding emerged, it was tied up in a certain way that made it around, uh, made it really close to this notion of feeling safe and included. So here are the eight areas of focus uh, that, that boards were asked to work on, and they include policies, uh, leadership, school community relationships, inclusive curriculum, religious accommodation, school climate, and the prevention of uh, discrimination and harassment, professional learning, and accountability and transparency. Again, all really good ideas. If you read that document, you will be impressed. And, and uh, I, I guess the challenge of all uh, of education is to live documents like this right to the level of the student in the classroom. And that continues to be our challenge. And we got the three definitions that we still use. Uh, we've modified some of them to uh, make them more understandable to the people that we speak to in terms of which, whichever audiences we're addressing. But those are core definitions that we still see. And this, and you know, for the first time, many people started using this graphic, and there have been tons of modifications, um, but it, it really tries to describe to the layperson what, what equity really means. Now, I, I would argue that there are a lot better ones that have emerged since, uh, but this was the one that everybody kind of knew and was up on some school walls and, and such the like. And so 2014 came, and I remember, I remember with Michelle, because Michelle and I were closely at the time, uh, we were so happy to see that ensuring equity was the second priority. Wow, that was awesome. Except we were a little confused, because we, we saw, we read past the, the main um, goal there, and then looked at it and thought, okay, this is an interesting uh, uh, interpretation of equity. And, and at that time, equity was coupled with well-being, right? And which is fine. No problem with uh, being coupled with well-being, but I think there was more that, that all of us wanted in that. That, you know, it, feeling safe and included is great, but it's not enough, because we have achievement gaps. And so, and so we, were, we were kind of talking about this, and, and that's why a forum, a forum like this 
start to push at those ideas and say, yeah, is that enough or do we need more? And, and there was a little bit of funding, a little more funding now, but it was bundled with well-being, mental health, and safe and accepting schools. It wasn't even, there wasn't even an equity category in there. So, so practically speaking, what happened here in school boards is you have a well-being lead, you have a mental health lead, and you have a safe and accepting schools lead and an equity lead. Here's a small amount of funding. Have a fight to see who gets it. So, you know, in its simplest incarnation, that funding was divided in four between those three or four portfolios. Still, still very minimal. Now look, on the funding piece, you have to realize that boards can allocate more funding than the ministry allocates to anything. And some boards have chosen to do that. Many of them are represented on this stage and in the audience because uh, there are boards here that allocate significant uh, discretionary funding to equity. But for those that don't, you're really strapped because you have to convince your trustees that it's worthwhile. And even the, 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 the boards that have, have had to go to their trustees and convince them that this is money well spent. So that was achieving excellence. And then, in September of last year, we got the Education Equity Action Plan. And this, again, crept closer to what, what hardcore equity <laughs> advocates, I would call them, want, right? Now we're talking about other things. Now we're talking about, you know, regardless of background, identity or personal circumstances, every student has an opportunity to be successful. And we had four key areas, right? Now we're getting into curriculum. Equity is about curriculum in many respects, right? Are our students represented in the curriculum that they experience in the classroom or the schools? And, the, and we talked about leadership, governance, and human resources. Who's in our schools? Who's leading our schools? Do the, do the people that are the people in our schools and who are leading our schools represent the diversity of Ontario? And I say that very intentionally because there are areas like mine that aren't very diverse. But our students will be interacting with students from all over the province in their lives. And they need to see teachers who represent the diversity of Ontario, leaders who represent the diversity of Ontario. So now we're getting closer. And data collection, integration, and reporting was kind of the cherry on the Sunday, right? Because this makes everything focus on who's not succeeding and why. And when we talk about students who are not succeeding, we don't blame the students. We always look back on ourselves and say, there's a reason they're not succeeding and it's centered in the classroom because of their experiences. So what can we do differently? We don't want to change students. We change what we do to help every student be successful. So that's the Education Equity Action Plan. And when we get to data collection, integration, and reporting, there's the goals within the Education Equity Action Plan. Now, um, I said yesterday, to those who were in the room yesterday, two school boards have already engaged in this in a fulsome way. Uh, other school boards have done uh, work at, represented at this table toward that. Um, and in the boards that, that have done so, there have been some things revealed on differential suspension data, achievement data. Some groups of students are, are achieving at differential levels. Um, there are questions about who is being streamed into applied courses. So these are the types of data that you can begin to deconstruct or have conversations about when you collect these data. And, and again, the, the way I like to position all of this is that data gives you the ability to ask questions, not so much make conclusions. And so some concrete 
things that will be happening next year based on this is changes to the principal performance appraisal and supervisory officer performance appraisal that focus in on equity accountability. There are 0.5 equity SO positions in the Toronto region and in the Thunder Bay region. Approximately 30 pilot school boards will be doing data collection. There is a regional human rights resource person in every, each of the six regions of the province. Culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy round two boards. There was a round uh, last year of 12 school boards that, that did work on that. And there is a, this one's interesting, 11 school boards have signed on to a suspension and expulsion pilot in which they agree not to suspend or expel in certain schools. That one's going to be really interesting. Okay, so, um, why? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? No data, no problem, no action. When we don't collect the data, we don't have data to tell us who is not, specific data to tell us who is not achieving. And when we don't have that data, we don't have a problem. And without a problem, we can't act. It's, this is similar to uh, you know, the long-form census controversy. When, when we moved away from the long-form census, we eliminated all kinds of data that the, that the government did not have to act on. Right? Similar. And we already collect data. All 72 school boards collect data for these groups of students. We're going to go deeper. The new survey tool, uh, and, and we heard about the 30 that are volunteering to do this in the next school year. The new survey tool will look at sexual orientation. We'll look at uh, place of origin. We'll look at uh, family composition. We'll look at socioeconomic data and allow us to establish um, how our students from these demographic uh, groups are doing. Now, um, I, I spoke briefly about the, the network that we're establishing in collaboration with York University. Um, Carl will co-chair it, and uh, we're inviting the boards that are engaging in this, as well as boards who are interested in this and want to act as friendly, critical friends or observers to join us as those 30 boards engage in this. And we want to learn together and share experiences together. So um, my, my email address will be up on the last slide, and I would invite any school board people interested to email me directly. Okay, so um, when, when it comes to equity leaders in the province, first of all, I, I'm looking around the room. We have the best of the best in the room, and the four people at the front of the room rise above in many ways, and they have been equity leaders for years, respected throughout the province, and we're really lucky to have them here um, to help us in our lear learning today. And I want to introduce each to you. Short, uh, Cecil? Okay. <laughs> Cecil Roach, York Region District School Board. In his long career as an educator, Cecil has had the opportunity to have a very profound impact on the lives of young people. He has done this as a classroom teacher, school administrator, and now coordinating superintendent of education. Born on the tiny Caribbean island of Montserrat and arriving in Canada in his early teens, Cecil completed most of his schooling in Montreal where he graduated from Marymount High School and Concordia and McGill Universities. He maintains that his time as one who has been termed the barrel children, children whose parents left them behind and with a grandparent while they prepare for their reunion in Canada, has given him a special insight into the dynamics of immigration and its effect on student achievement and well-being. This experience has also strengthened Mr. Roach's belief that schools are places where students, regardless of their social identities, can expand 
dreams on their journey towards full participation in Canadian society. Cecil is currently serving as coordinating superintendent, equity and community services for the York Region District School Board. Cecil sums up his uh, role by contending that when the doors of our schools and work sites swing open every morning, the students, staff and community members who enter, regardless of their social identity, know that they are entering places where they are safe, respected and have strong feelings of inclusion and belonging. Please help me welcome Cecil Roach. Pauline Gruel is currently the Associate Director of Instruction and Equity with the Peel District School Board. Before taking on this role, she was Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. Pauline was pursuing her doctoral degree in socio socio Sociology and Equity studies at OISI before taking a leave to focus on her new role in Peel. And her 16-year-old son, who is an awesome volleyball player. Is he representing Ontario? He is, yes. I follow him on Twitter. Pauline is str a strong advocate for equity and inclusion, currently the board lead on the We Rise Together Action Plan to support black male youth. And Pauline has co-authored a book for the Ontario Principals Council, The Principal as Equitable Leader. She often talks about the importance of recognizing lived experiences of people and the critical role of narrative inquiry in curriculum and leadership development. Ladies and gentlemen, Pauline Gruel. <laughs> Michelle Coutinho is the... Just, just clarify, I didn't know these were going to be read out loud. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll edit as I go, Michelle. Michelle Coutinho is the Principal of Equity and Inclusive Education at the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. She's worked there for over 25 years. It's a long time, Michelle, as a teacher and administrator. For the last six years, Michelle's work has focused on inclusion and ensuring the dignity of students and staff is upheld. And I got to tell you that in the world of Catholic education, Michelle is the top equity leader. So please welcome Michelle. Mohammed Amid is a lifelong learner and is superintendent of education with the Durham District School Board who is committed to equity and inclusion. He has spent the last 23 years creating innovative learning culture and is currently most passionate about the work he is doing to support the diverse communities of Durham. As an immigrant to Canada turned educator, Mohammed has developed a unique perspective when it comes to education in marginalized communities. Influenced by ongoing conversations with knowledge keepers and elders, he aspires to bring multiple ways of knowing into schools and classrooms. While education is his primary job function by day, Muhammad also enjoys spending time with his family and finding mountains, waves, and roads to ride. Please welcome Mo Hamid. All right, um, one thing that I didn't mention at the end of my little uh, retrospective is um, we, so I landed on the last slide which talked about, you know, stuff that's going on over the next year. What, what we're not certain of at this time is anything beyond the next year. And so I've asked the panelists to, um, without getting too political folks, uh, you know, we, we're really about kids, but we recognize that this is a political thing. So I've asked, um, I've asked the panelists to think about including in their remarks something about um, their board's commitment to equity, which can, um, which can exist separate of any government mandates, right? School boards do a lot of things that ministries don't uh, legislate for. So I've asked them to think about including something about that. But the format that we're going to use right now is a 10-minute presentation by each panelist. And um, the questions that they have been asked to reflect on are on the next slide. And we'll then go into a 15 to 20-minute audience Q&A. So the two questions are, what um, were or are the key steps or key learnings from your board's um, 
planning or, or al already collection, integration and reporting of identity-based data. And, and you have to realize that some of these things are happening as we speak, so it's not in the past, it's happening now. And what challenges and opportunities have emerged or are emerging in the process of identity-based data collection, integration, and reporting? And uh, we, we had a discussion about who would go first, and uh, Cecil's name came up as the, as the um, respected person in this, most respected person in this panel. So I, I didn't say elder. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start with Cecil. Thank you, Jack. Uh, and uh, so I'll let you know that um, we need to work on our anti-bullying policies here because I think I was bullied. <laughs> and um, I kept saying, you know, you go first. No, no, you go. Anyway, so I'm it. Um, first of all, how many teachers are in the room? Amazing. So really, you guys are where it's at, OK? you are where the rubber hits the road, I'd like to say. Um, it is the work that you do that, will, that really make the difference in students' lives. Those of us, the further away we get from the classroom, the, the less influence we, we have, even though we do have a tremendous amount of influence, particularly in terms of creating the conditions for you to do great jobs in your classroom. But it's really important that when we talk about equity and inclusion, that you as teachers buy in and understand that you need to create classrooms that are equitable and, and inclusive. So first of all, so I, I'm, I'm not a spokesperson for the York Region District School Board, um, even though I work for the York Region District School Board. And, but in fact, I guess I am. It's like Twitter. You know, when you, when you, you put at the end of your introduction, tweets are my own. Uh, but in the final analysis, you still are a representative of the organization that you work for. And, um, you know, and if you follow me on Twitter, you know, you know that we, 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 those of us who work in education are very cautious about some of the things that we say on Twitter because of the fact that even though we put that little caveat that tweets are our own, we still work for, work for the boards. Uh, one of the things I always like to talk about before we I get into the notion of, of, of data and our journey around data collection is you know, we need to think about what brings us to education. Uh, and um, those of you who know me know I like poetry. And, and I, I, you know, when I was in CJEP in Montreal, um, I was exposed to, to, to Claude McKay. Uh, and um, he has a poem with the first two verses that says, when I plucked my soul out of its secret place and held it to the mirror of mine eye. Uh, and the, 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 what I say is when you hold your teacher soul, and regardless of what you are in education, you are fundamentally a teacher, what do you see? So I, I, like, I like to talk about what discourse do you bring to education? Um, because what I see is that schooling and public education offers an opportunity to really interrupt long-standing patterns of marginalization. Uh, that, that, I mean, I, it certainly did for me, and, and, I, when, when I first came to this country and, and my mom picked me up at the airport, um, she said, remember you're here for schooling. <laughs> You're here because of education, and, and if, if that thing if, if it doesn't happen right for you, you wouldn't believe what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> so uh, I, I, you know, that, that's uh, that's an important thing for for you to understand. Some people say, "What's your philosophy of education?" But really, it's the discourse that you bring uh, and the understanding that you have such a tremendous influence in terms of what happens to kids and and, and their families. Um, as well, you remember, your your job is not to replicate the inequities that exist in society. Your job is to try your best to interrupt them. Okay, so I, I think that's, that's an important thing for us to, to start. And as a board, we, we've been on an, interest, an interesting journey in terms of data collection. Um, you know, we, 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 in 2013, we started this, this journey to actually implement what we called then the Every Student Count Survey. Um, that name is back, and, and in fact, we will be implementing the Every Student Count Survey in November. But we, we you know, we, we got to the point of actually designing the tool, um, you know, and, and had dates to, to, to deliver the tool, and then that was interrupted, so to speak. But it, I think it's important for me to outline what we did prior to, you know, to being at the point of actually implementing the tool. Um, we knew that there were two boards who had done this before, Ottawa and Toronto. We, you know, I, I went to visit my good buddy Jim Sparopoulos in Toronto at the time, and a group of us actually took a, a trip to Ottawa. We, we spent a day in Ottawa, um, just 
it, you know, learning from them about some of the pitfalls, some of the issues that they faced. One of the things that we learned at the time was that you know, when they were just about ready to uh, implement their, their survey, there was an article in the Toronto, in the Toronto Sun, uh, Ottawa Sun, I should say, that said um, Ottawa board uh, asking the kids if they're gay. Uh, and um, that put a bit of a, a long pause on things because they were inundated with calls around, um, around that particular issue. Uh, and um, what, it, what we learned from that is that we needed to work with our communities around un bringing them to understand um, the need for data, um, the need to collect the, d the data, and the kind of questions that, that, that we needed to ask. So we, we, we certainly you know, we knew that we weren't going to uh, invent the wheel or reinvent the wheel. We're going to learn from those who had done it before. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, I've always, like, 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 it's really interesting when I think about data collection because to me it's been over 50 years that I've been hearing about this, it seems, that, that this notion of, in two, two provinces, I, I, I taught in, in, in Montreal for eight years before I came to Ontario. And again, back then they were talking about data. But I think the Quebec government at, at, at the time understood schooling as, as, a, as a way of, of, of changing society, because if you know anything about the La Revolution Tranquille, the Quiet Revolution, they actually use schooling as a way of transforming their society, and, and actually of, of ensuring that, that Franco, that, that French, French Quebecers actually, actually regain control of their society through schooling. Uh, they, they did it by bringing in free CJEP, which is taking two years out of the university and make it into a free um, you know, college system that everyone had to access, everyone had access to. Uh, you know, so you either went to college and did a three year, let's say a nursing diploma or two year pre-university program. So Quebec understood quickly that, that education was the way of changing their society and they've, done, they've been very successful at, at doing that. So you know, we, we, I think we understood that, that you know, we can't have 50 years of chronic, persistent, Underachievement by identifiable groups of students and think that that's normal. Okay, you know, we, we cannot have 50 years of a clear achievement gap. I know that's the term in Ontario, uh, achievement gap for identifiable groups of students. I mean, we know the numbers for black students. When I first came to Ontario, there was talk about Portuguese students and, and, and how they were underachieving. Uh, we understand, we, we now fully understand the embarrassing issue with indigenous students and, and, and the fact that, that their, their dropout rates and their achievement rates are actually. You know, I, I think a national shame, actually, um, when, when you think about it. Uh, and you know, of course, we know that student social identities are not linear. They're, they're certainly intersection of identities um, because we know that many, I mean, these very students, same students, actually live in the lower rung of the socioeconomic ladder. Um, like I, I know, t if you look at the TDSB data, you'll see, for example, black students between 69 and 80 percent of them live in the two lowest come from families that live in the two lowest income, that is families who earn less than $30,000 and families who earn $30,000 to $49,000. An interesting little caveat about that data, because you know, we, we know our East Asian students do really well academically, but when you look at, when you, when you look, when you, you know, peel the onion a little deeper and you look at East Asian students from mainland China, you have over 60% of those, again, living in the two lowest um, socioeconomic groups. Yeah, you know, the, those who are from mainland China, those who are from Hong Kong are doing a lot better socioeconomically. So certainly we know that there's, there, 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 there's intersection of identities that is important for us to, think, to talk about and, and to realize. Um, so, you know, again, we talk about achievement gap, and we know achievement gap is done by what we call measurement instruments, report card data, EQA data, and, and so on. But there's also an opportunity gap that we need to know about. And the opportunity gap is who are our kids that are uh, in the, the, the applied stream or, or the college workplace streams? Who are our kids that are getting suspended and expelled? Who are our kids who are not graduating from, from, from high school and so on? So that's the opportunity gap that we need to think about and that the data will help us understand. Um, because there's no question, and, and I think that, that, that compelling data can help us determine the kind of, of, of explicit intervention strategies that we need to support kids, support those kids. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I think it's also an economic, uh, an economic, you know, imperative as well, because kids who do well tend not to end up in our prison systems, for example. I mean, in the US, they talk about the school to prison pipeline, and actually, 
for a short period of time, I, I looked after student discipline, and one mom said that to me. I, I'm worried that my son is going to end up in that school to prison pipeline. And, and she, she said to me, you know the kids who are in the Roy McMurtry Center, 72% 70, of them have not graduated from high school. So I, mean, I, I think it's a compelling economic argument as far as we're concerned to ensure that we collect the data, we know who the kids are, and we design the kinds of programs and the kinds of interventions that will support them. You know, I, I, I will end by, by saying, you know, in 1979, Ron Edmonds talked about the, the fact that, you know, um, we, we, know, we already know everything that we need to know to support kids. What really is the problem is that we need to think about why we haven't done it, why we haven't done it already. Those, they, I, I have the exact quote somewhere, but that's the gist of what he said. We know what we needs to be done, and part of what needs to be done is to know who our kids are, to understand the correlation between social identity and achievement. And look, I, I need to be clear, certainly success in school is more than academic achievement. Right? And we know that, for example, our 2SLGBTQ kids, they may do well academically, but they, they, if we have high suicide rate, a sense of, of not belonging to the, to, to the system, um, a sense of, of being bullied, so clearly it's, it's a problem. If, if you're a Jewish kid and, and, and you're living in a, in a community where anti-Semitism is rampant, clearly your schooling experience is not, going to be, is not going to be good, even though you might be doing well academically. So I, I think the schooling experience has to be a total school experience where all kids feel that they belong, feel that they're welcome, and feel that they're included. And, and I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, perhaps answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sasa. We'll, uh, we'll take questions at the end for our panelists, but we're going to move on to Pauline. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Cecil did a fantastic job around raising, like, laying the context in terms of why collecting data is important, so I won't have to do that. I'm still stuck on um, tweets will be my own when I can retire. I can't wait. <laughs> um, because um, every time you go to tweet, you got to kind of think and go, okay, how is this going to be perceived? So I'm still a few years away from that. <laughs> can't wait till that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey we've taken um, in the Peel District School Board around collecting data. Um, obviously, in our strategic plan, and most boards in their strategic plans now, um, ours is called the Plan for Student Success, there would be some kind of, hopefully, uh, some vision around equity and inclusion. And really, one of our four pillars is around equity and inclusion. Um, twofold, in terms of data collection and peel, we've done a workplace census. So we're looking at workplace equity. Um, and actually, this is my little um, a spiel here. 11 o'clock, our manager of workplace equity, Farrell Hall, will be talking about the journey we took there. But then there's the other equity initiatives that really impact our students, the, the, the communities that we serve. Um, in terms of the workplace equity piece, I'm just going to briefly say, uh, a few years ago, we embarked on um, the journey ahead, which was looking at uh, basically inequitable hiring practices in our board because it was quite obvious. Um, we knew when we looked, like visible diversity, that um, our staff did not represent the communities that we served. Uh, we heard um, from our communities, we heard from our staff, uh, words like nepotism came up. Um, and it was tough work that we had to kind of wrestle with and to face that there were systemic barriers that existed for people from, for example, racialized communities uh, to get into our board. Um, a number of recommendations came in, uh, one of which was to conduct um, a workforce census. So we did engage in a workforce census a couple of years ago and we had a great success rate, um, but the data showed us um, that uh, there, we were nowhere near um, representation of our communities and we compare that to uh, the census data that that existed um, but what's interesting is we also learned and not surprisingly as we moved up you know kind of levels in in employment within our board it got even more um, you know male oriented white uh, Christian etc cetera, etc cetera. Surpr no, no, no surprise to everybody um, however, I think that was our first kind of viewpoint into data collection, and I'm not going to speak about that. What I want to talk to you about today is our journey around the student census. So um, 
as a board, we've been doing equity initiatives for years. And I think in Peel, um, it's been part of our strategic plan. And, and although sometimes resources, we pay probably perhaps weren't resourced enough, but the initiative that really got us talking about the importance before the ministry um, around data collection was our We Rise Together work. Uh, so our We Rise Together work uh, was around, is around, is around supporting our black male youth, and now we've kind of encompassed to support um, all black youth. Um, we obviously, you know, we know the research is out there. We have the TDSB data. Um, you just have to open a newspaper, turn on the news, and you see what is happening with our black students and our and our black community. And uh, so we engaged in, in some more research. We engaged in talking to our community. Uh, we created an action plan um, that was really going to tackle um, some of the. Um, uh, I would say systemic barriers that our students were facing in our schools. Our students told us, um, you know, we are being pushed to apply level programming. Um, the expectations for us are not high enough. Uh, people see us, staff see us as violent. Um, staff see us as criminals. Other students are also seeing us in the, in the same manner. So those were some hard things that we, we knew they were there, but when you hear them out of student voices and you talk about lived experiences, it's hard to kind of shy away from that and think we're not gonna do anything about that. Um, so as we were working on that plan, um, the question started to come about, you know, we all talk about equity, but true equity work is doing something different for a particular group and naming it. And that was hard work for us because I think people said, well, what about, X group or X group. We're predominantly South Asian, but our South Asian students uh, were doing relatively well. And so it was some, some struggles with staff to be able to land on the fact that we were gonna name it and we were gonna say that we were uh, working on an initiative that was focused last year on black male youth. Um, and then the question comes, how do you know you're making a difference? So you put all this into place. Do you even know who your students are? And the same conversation was happening with the Workforce Census. Great. So you know who your staff is. Who are your students? Um, so really, it was our trustee and our vice chair, Suzanne Nurse, in the spring of 2017. So before the ministry's equity strategy, um, she put a motion on the floor, which uh, basically uh, was supported unanimously by our board. Uh, to conduct and to engage in a student census that um, is was to be completed uh, is to be completed uh, by December 2018, and that's how uh, where we are right now. The focus of the entire year, and there's a number of people who sit on um, our committee uh, for student census. It took us the whole year of last year to start to conduct uh, and think about what kind of questions we want to ask, um, meet with community, uh, meet with a number of stakeholders. Uh, we used a similar model that we used for the workplace census, which was to have a steering committee. And our steering committee consisted of our union groups. Um, it consisted of trustee representation, our principals, our vice principals, uh, specific staff from various departments, um, such as communications, research, uh, curriculum, special education, and it consisted of our community as well. Um, we also did go back to students. Our students were our, our, uh, the group that we did our pilot with to say, are we getting the questions that, that you want us to do? Um, so I have to say this work started before the ministry session and before the anti-racism directorate kind of came up with their categories as well. Um, so as a result of that, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we've run into and I think I have a conversation with the ministry scheduled for next week where I might have to do some pushing back. But nevertheless, our student census um, has is twofold. Obviously, we're collecting demographic data, so some of the data that you know that we're typically collect is there, but also sexual orientation, um, race, um, country of origin, language is spoken at home, some socioeconomic um, data as well. But we're also collecting perceptual data, so we're we're going to be doing that together and really asking questions such as when you walk into your school, do you feel represented? by you from your from for example from an identity based um, and we are conducting the census from um, k all the way to our adult learners and uh, for the k to uh, three we're going to be having um, 
parents supporting in, in conducting that census, and then from uh, four to adult learners, the students will be engaging in that process. Um, we completed a pilot in May 2018 in a family of schools. Wow, we learned so much about the questions that we as adults thought were really clear, and kids are saying to you, this makes no sense to us, and we will administer um, our, our census uh, November 2018. We'll have a two-week window. Um, the second piece I want to talk about was around the role of the community. So we did have a number of stakeholders on our steering committee, but as we were working through this process, um, we had to go to SEAC, so our Special Education Advisory Council. Um, wow, they had so much to say to us around um, how we need to ask some of those questions, especially around uh, special education. And, and interestingly enough, I think we were more inclusive in our language and we're getting some pushback actually from the ministry and the way we're asking questions. We were trying to be more inclusive. They wanted to ask in a particular way. Parent Involvement Committee. Uh, we went to our We Rise Together Community Advisory, which is our work around black youth, our senior team, our trustees, and, and other parent, parent groups as well. The biggest question we heard from our community, so, okay, that's great, you're gonna get this data, but what are you gonna really do with it? So you have it. Are we just going to be buying into some of those same concerns um, and blame the student or blame the community? Um, so, the big question that we're going to be wrestling with is, are we ready to deal with what the story the data is going to tell us? Um, are we going to get into that blame and shame game that sometimes we often do in, with marginalized communities? Or are we going to be introspective and start to think, what are those systemic barriers that have led for students um, to feel and, and be in, in certain situations. I always say um, data can always be manipulated. And this is where community needs to play um, a very important role because they're not going to trust us if we are gonna be sitting in our ivory towers and uh, analyzing this, uh, this data. There's a couple of challenges I just wanted to highlight before I uh, finish off. First of all, um, challenges. The number one challenge is always around resources. But if your board feels this is important work, you're going to put um, resources towards it. The ministry was great in providing uh, money for us. We're part of the first kind of wave of boards doing this. But also, we have a very large research department. So we have the support there to be able to do the work and we're collecting all the data in-house. Um, people ask paper, electronic, we've gone paper and I could give you a whole session on why. Um, but the second challenge we, we are experiencing right now is because we were head of the anti-racism directorate in the ministry, we're having to justify what we're asking and why we're asking and how we're asking after we've done community outreach and input. So my conversation next week with the ministry is, no, 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 I get it, you want me to ask this way, but we have worked a year on these questions. So you can't come here right now to tell me that we got to ask it differently because we have built the trust with the community to say this is how we're going to ask questions. So that's been huge. And then the biggest thing I'm going to say is going to be around understanding how we're going to look at the data. Are we aware of our biases? Are we aware of our stereotypes? Are we aware of our power and privilege as we're looking at that data? Because if you just look at it through the same lens that we've been looking at, sometimes equity initiatives, it doesn't matter how much data you have. You're going to manipulate that data so that it suits what you want to do and how you want to perceive um, certain communities. And then the final piece with, I think, the, the whole politics that are going on now, not sure what's gonna happen, equity work will continue. Um, we started this work not with because the ministry told us. We started this work because our communities expected us to do it, our staff expected us to do it, it's the right thing to do. In some ways, there's a little bit of excitement to say we're gonna go insular and do the work that's uh, most important. Um, in, our, in my Sikh faith, uh, we have a saying that says chardikala, and chardikala means joy and optimism in the face of adversity, and, and that's the way we'll move on. I'm gonna invite Michelle Coutinho up from Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Hi, I'm going to old school with a PowerPoint, if that's okay. <laughs> They're basically my cue cards for speaking. Um, we had this discussion about equity in my department. Uh, we've had the discussion about data for about three, four years. And when I say department, I say 1.5 people total. 
So it was a very uh, interesting discussion because we were like, we need to do this, but how are we going to do this with 1.5 people? Uh, now we're two. <laughs> so very happy about that. And we uh, sucked in a whole bunch of other people. And that is because it sort of goes back to what Pauline is saying. Th these decisions start at the head of the organization. And when you have the head of the organization, organization on board, it makes your path much easier. Uh, not to say that there aren't still going to be obstacles. Uh, there will be, but it's good when somebody else is sort of clearing the path for you. Uh, so we, I did a little bit of reflecting and, you know, we, we measure and we capture what's important. I heard somebody, uh, I'm a photographer, and somebody said, you take pictures of what you value. Look at your house and see your, what your pictures are. So I did that and I thought, oh, okay, family, travel, and I realized I have a weird obsession with food. I found <laughs> out. Um, and in education, we capture what's important. Right? And going back to what Jack was talking about, you know, equity is supposed to be one of the four priorities. Where are we capturing that? How do we know? Are we going to say math is a priority and not measure math at all? No, that seems ridiculous. So why is that okay to do with equity? And I think something, uh, what one of the stumbling blocks is, is people are afraid, right? People don't want to have this conversation. They're uncomfortable with it. They don't know what to do once the data is there. Okay, great, we find this out, but now what do we do? We've been trying to solve this problem of inequity in society for years. So there's a fear that once we have this data, we're a little bit exposed, and what do we do with it? So what did we do? We went to the students. We decided we're going to find out what our students are saying. I don't know if you've ever had um, an argument with your, your significant other or your partner. Um, I can't say you did this and you did that because they, they just come back with an argument. If I say, I feel this way, it's hard for them to argue that. So that's what we did. We thought, let's find out what our students, what their experience is. So we did last year an online survey. It's completely voluntary. Uh, we had a lot of uptake from our schools, which is great. We had entire classrooms and departments bringing their kids in, having them access technology so they can complete this online. We also did focus groups. We went into every one of our 26 secondary schools and set up focus groups. It had nothing to do with the school. So we really tried to set up a safe space where no one in the school knew who was coming to these focus groups. No one from the school was allowed to be in the focus group, right? A lot of our administrators were like, okay, I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna be part of it. We're like, no, this is a safe space for our students. The facilitators, they were all central board staff. We made sure we had racialized people in the room. We made sure we had uh, gender balance. And we made sure the numbers were small in terms of the facilitators. And so this was really a space for students to talk. This was all great when we were talking about it in my department of two. But we're really worried about the um, uptake that we would get. So we rolled out the survey. We had 9,000 students respond. We, we only have about 30,000 secondary students. 9,000 of them took the time to respond to the survey. Our focus groups, we had five, over 500 kids. We tried not to turn students away, but you know when you do a focus group, you can only have so many people. And we were there for hours. They wanted to talk. They wanted to tell us their experiences. So that's what our um, sort of voyage into data looked like. So these are just some of the demographics. I'm going to go through it really quickly because it's not about the demographics. It's about our experiences. Uh, we had students equally from grade 9 to 12. Um, the gender identity of our students was pretty much uh, half male, half female, if, they, if that's how they identified. And we had 2% um, of our students identify as trans. Um, these are, now, this is how they identified um, according to ethnicity or race, but what's interesting is Jack and I have sat at the table. There are some boards that are uh, having a discussion with the ministry about data collection. And within the sessions that we've been having, we have had multiple people say, well, students aren't going to know how to identify. <laughs> They're not going to know what, okay? So we discussed, well, that's a very uh, privileged 
way of thinking because I know my daughter has known since she was young what her heritage is and why because we're proud and we talk about it but she gets asked the question right where are you from and then the follow-up know where are you really from right so it's interesting the perception that people have and how they think that will impact data collection uh, and we also did, um, we wanted to know our religious affiliations of our students. This is what we learned. You know what the top issue is that our students brought to mind? Mental health. And it was interesting because they talked about mental health according to orientation, gender identity, ethnicity. Uh, we also asked the students uh, questions about what should we do? Okay, you're saying this is a problem, what should we do about it? The second biggest issue they talked about was representation. We're not represented in the curriculum. And we know that. And we can go to teachers at workshops and say, our students are not represented in the curriculum. But when you actually have students saying, I, you know, I only learn about uh, someone from the black community during Black History Month, right? Like Hidden Figures, great movie. It's only shown during Black History Month. Why not show it during a math class or a science class, right? So they talked about this. And what we did is we captured their quotes and we're using them as we go forward with staff. Uh, the third thing they talked about was relationships. They want to develop relationships with their teachers. They want to be able to talk about things that are important to them. I got the two minute mark, so I'm, I'm moving along. Um, okay, at the end of it, this is what our students said. The first thing they said is, thank you. I, I can't believe you're actually taking the time to, to come here and talk to me about my identity. The second thing is, can we talk about this more? They wanted to talk, they wanted to have these discussions. And then they held us accountable. They said, now what? It's great that you're doing this, but what are you gonna do? So what are we gonna do? We're rolling this data out with our administrators, with our school teams. From Now, the survey was secondary, but we're rolling it out K to 12. So everybody has an idea, because when you're in secondary, the students are not talking about just their experiences in your secondary. This is a sum of what's happened to them throughout their existence in our schools. So that's where we're going, and I wanna say once again, the challenges are nobody wants to do this data because they don't know what to do with it. And secondly is leadership. And thankfully, whatever changes come in the near future, I, I'm happy to say that our leadership is on board and I think our, all of our boards are in the same position that we know that we're gonna barrel through this with this work regardless. And hopefully they won't have any sanctions for, sanctions for us like uh, the health and phys ed curriculum. <laughs> look, at, look at Michelle getting all political. Um, okay. And next, and our final presenter is Mo Hamid from Durham District School Board. All right. So our journey in Durham is similar to most of the school boards here in, in terms of, of how we got to this point. And really for, for us, the conversation really came around the notion of who is it that we are serving in our schools. And I want folks to think a little bit deeply about that because that's, that's really uh, the driving force be behind why we need to um, engage in this pathway around identity data collection. And, but we can't forget, as many of my colleagues spoke about, you know, the parallel conversation is who are we? Because there's conversations that need to happen around who we are or else we're going to output the same kind of patterns of achievement that we're outputting now. And I'm gonna refer to the concept of the algorithm a lot in this. And that algorithm really is the idea of when we put data into an algorithm, if we don't change the algorithm, the output will remain the same. And so, to think about that, oh, I'm gonna have a hard time reading that, so let me come over here. <laughs> to think about that, this is a statement that was written by three superintendents, two of which are here, uh, and Toronto, York, and Durham. Uh, and it's, the, it's a statement that anchors uh, and, and opens our, our equity documents. And so I'll just read just a little bit of it, just to give you a, a sense. Our students live in houses, apartments, hotels, shelters, foster homes, and group homes. Our students live in communities that are rural, urban, quiet, exuberant, fast-paced, tightly knit, or loosely connected. Some of our students express their gender identities in a male-female binary. Others express their gender identities on fluid continuum. They all find love in different ways. 
Our students come from families that are led by same-sex partners, single parents, partners who are married or not, grandparents, foster families, aunts, uncles, or siblings. And I can continue on. But that gives you a sense around the reality of the dimensions of identity that are in our classrooms and in our staff. And so if we as educators are really thinking about this notion of a sense of belonging and developing a sense of belonging, the notion of identity data is critical. It's a critical conversation that we need to be thinking about. I often refer to the idea that you need to have Maslow before Blooms. You need to have developed that sense of belonging, that sense of safety, emotional and, and physical safety. Because if you don't have that, even the most well thought out lesson plan will not work. It just won't work. So if we aren't creating learning spaces where the identities of our students can thrive and move freely, where people don't have to sacrifice aspects of their identity when they enter into the space, then we're going to repeat the patterns of achievement that we're seeing. And we're going to not be able to increase equitable outcomes for all. It just can't happen. Very briefly, just some data from Durham, and I'm sure it's data that you've seen uh, because it mirrors the data in the GTA. Just in Durham alone, and this is from 2011, and this has changed so much since then, as I'm sure you can, can imagine. 66% of the population growth in Durham has come from immigration. 66%. And with that immigration comes increasing emerging identities and dimensions of identity. And that's not even including the communities that have been existing in Durham for a long time, our indigenous community our black community. Those communities have been existing in Durham for a long time. So it's essential that we start to integrate data streams into the algorithm that helps us to understand that. And that's where the role of community comes in. Because community are, are critical partners in this process. Critical. Because if we don't engage community beyond consultation. It must be beyond consultation. As essentials, essential partners in this process, that algorithm that I talk about will not change. Because what community does is it helps us to understand different ways of knowing and understanding and thinking. And we need to ask ourselves, what are the multiple ways of knowing that we have sitting when we are working through streams of data and trying to break that apart? How are we thinking differently? Pauline spoke about that. If we don't do things differently and think about things differently, that algorithm will just output the same patterns of achievement. And we also need to think about the reality that trust is not there when it comes to identity data collection. Just think of self-identification with our indigenous communities. Just think of the history of what has happened when we've collected identity data in our past. We all know examples. When we start getting into classification and symbolization, we know where that leads. So why would the community trust this process? So these are very, very critical conversations that we need to explicitly have. And these are the conversations that in Durham we're starting in this journey. We're a little bit behind. We're starting into the data collection process this year. This is the year that we're doing all of these pieces. And so the challenge that we think about, really, when it comes to that community piece is the engagement. And how are we incrementally building confidence through meaningful participation in every aspect of the process, beyond consultation, every aspect of the process, including who's analyzing the data? We have to think about that. That notion of meaningful participation is something that's central to a democratic education system. All members of that system need to be able to participate, to have meaningful participation. They, they should not need to sacrifice their identity to engage. So these are pieces that, that really we've been talking about in Durham and thinking a little bit about as, about as we go down this road. And so when I think about some of the challenges very briefly, the first ch challenge, and, and it's hard to distill it into three, but really that conversation in terms of who are we. And I speak about that from a, on the spectrum, from a demographic perspective in terms of who are we, in terms of who's literally standing in front of the students and making decisions to how are we recognizing our lived experience as educators and thinking about the dimensions of identity that are coming into our classrooms and learning things differently to change that algorithm. This question is critical as well. Who is sitting at the table? We know that indigenous students need to have access to, to indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, to help make sense of the 
dimensions of their identity. So do we have Indigenous elders or knowledge keepers sitting at the table when we're going through data collection analysis for Indigenous students? Because if we don't, how can we expect to output something different? How's that going to happen? It can. So we need to ask ourselves that question. Who is sitting at the table in our schools when we're, when we're having uh, uh, student team conversations around programming decisions for students? We need to change that, change that thinking. And this is something that we're talking about and, and, and really in our service agreements with our First Nation partners, building in language that brings elders into the conversation. When we're working in some of our communities in, in Ajax, which is where my family of schools are, when we're starting to think about how we're bringing knowledge keepers in the community or cultural uh, uh, leaders in the community into the conversation and all aspects to start to build that trust incrementally. And then there's that conversation around what knowledge is valued. Because if we think that we're going to get these streams of data coming into our, into our um, algorithm, if you want to call it that, and we're going to go to the historical um, streams of knowledge that we've used in the past, I suggest to you that those streams of knowledge aren't going to be able to give us what we need in order to be able to uh, provide more responsive decisions. We have to think about what knowledge we value, change it, and through engagement with community, expand it. And then we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing differently now? What are we going to do differently? How are we going to create spaces in the classroom, again, where those identities can thrive and move freely? Is that quick for you? Thank you, Mo. All right, we have two microphones set up um, near the back of the room on every stairwell, and I see people lining up already. We have about 15 minutes for a Q&A. Uh, folks, uh, sometimes these things become like minor kind of soapboxes to, you know, yeah, express your opinions, which is great. We can do that all day, but um, let's try to keep it to a, a minor soapbox and a, and a question. How about that? Okay. All right, let's start. Uh, please tell us who you are and uh, what your role is. Uh, Leslie Eddy. I'm a psychologist with the York Region District School Board. This past June, I was able to present on heterosexism and homophobia, as well as gender identity at the Equity Symposium with our board. And I really appreciate Cecil talking about um, a lot of LGBTQA students, uh, two-spirited students, may do well academically, but there's a lot of microaggressions in our society. Um, there's sometimes not a sense of belonging, and there's bullying. So I'm wondering now with the new news um, from the provincial government that we can t um, discuss um, same-sex relationships or um, LGBT issues how do we, as equity, I don't know, leaders, initiatives, um, ensure a sense of safety and belonging for students that may feel internalized um, homophobia due to the messages that we can talk about their issues in school? Thank you. Maybe we'll take one more question and we'll go to the panel for some responses to both, okay? One more question. Hi, my name's Arthur Burroughs. I'm a Master of Education student here at York University. I'm just wondering where you're at with open access for all of this data. Um, obviously, you know, there are privacy considerations, but after that, uh, is that part of the process that's ongoing now? And if not, why not? Okay, great. So let's go to our panelists. Uh, Cecil, do you want to take the uh, I think first I'll question? take on the first one. Yeah, How's sure. That? Um, I, I, and so as it's important for me to say that support for two LGBTQ students goes beyond the health curriculum. Uh, and, and I think it's important that, that you know, boards, and I think most boards are, uh, are either at there or on that journey, that we develop the kinds of supports um, to support uh, you know, this, this, this part of our social identity that's in our schools. And a lot of the work uh, as well, we'll, we'll be relying and partnering with staff and students who are 2S LGBTQ. Uh, you know, I, I always say, like I come from a community that is a loud, um, strong advocate community. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that's, that's how we've gotten things done. My mother used to always say, you stand on the shoulders of people who have make noise when there's trouble. Uh, and and I, I always say, you know, uh, it's important that our 2S LGBTQ staff 
stand up and be counted in terms of advocating for the kinds of supports that you need in, in school boards. Um, you know, as, as I, I speaking as an ally, obviously I can't speak for 2SLGBTQ staff and students, but I, I, I know that I want to support, but, but it's, it's critical that in all district school boards that staff feel that they can speak up about these issues and feel that they can work on designing the kinds of support that um, will, will ensure that, you know, students and staff feel um, supported and included. Because we do have a lot of staff who also feel that, you know, there's a lot of microaggressions in, in staff room and, and a lot of comments in staff room, particularly for those who are not necessarily out in, in their schools. And I know it's particularly tough for elementary male gay men who, 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 work in, who, work, who work in elementary schools around this whole notion of how do I work with my social identity, how do I acknowledge my social identity in those kinds of contexts. But my, to me, the answer is you have to speak up and you have to speak out. Um, speak out, by the way, is the name of our conference to support um, to us LGBTQ um, students. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I think that's critical. It doesn't matter who the government is. You know, boards will listen to voices that are strong advocate voices. Uh, and and um, I, it's just critical, critically important that that happens. Um, there, there's no question, as I said before, that, you know, we, we talk about achievement data, and even though kids are doing well, when I was a principal in, 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 in one particular school, I had you know, kids come to me and say, you know, you know sir, um, you know, I'm hearing these comments, and there's something that we need to do about it. I said, well, why don't we form a gay straight alliance and, and, and start you know, talk, talking about the kinds of things that we need to do to support you. Michelle. So, well, Cecil, when you started, can you hear me? Yeah. When you started, you talked about bullying, right? right? And I think bullying has, um, in a sense, confined us. We need to start naming it, and Jack, this is something that you taught me. When we talk about student behavior, we need to name it. We need to use those words, homophobia. We need to use sexism. When we use this catch-all of bullying, we allow people, thank you, to get away with things that they shouldn't be. We need to, part of our, when we're talking about discipline and we're talking about students who are marginalized, we need to uh, name the behavior. So if it's racism, homophobia, sexism, we need to call it out as teachers, as administrators, and I think um, that's a very powerful tool when we start to use those words. Uh, if I may just add uh, a reflection from our inner discussions at our school board. Our students are LGBTQ to us and we address the needs of our students and that's not, that doesn't depend on curriculum for us. I mean, everything that happens in a school is curriculum, right? every experience that a student ha has. And when our students and our families represent diverse groups, that is our responsibility to engage and make sure that our students are taken care of. So that does not stop with expectations that don't, aren't included in the curriculum, mm -hmm. right? And remember one thing about expectations. Those are the minimum, the minimum standards that we are asked to, uh, to teach in our schools. We, we go beyond those all the time. So, uh, now, there's other stuff happening, and you know all about that, and, and maybe that's not the topic for today. Listen, we're gonna take care of our LGBTQ2S students and families. Absolutely, no doubt about it. There's no question about that. And I wouldn't be afraid to, to deal with those issues as they, arrive in, uh, as they arise in classrooms. Pauline's gonna answer the second question. Yeah. Pauline. Yeah. So, sorry, just to build on the first question first. Uh, we also are um, under the, the whole tenets around the Ontario Human Rights Code, right? So everybody has to be in an environment and education free of discrimination. So that's going to be definitely a leverage point as uh, we work through some of the challenges um, that perhaps are coming. In terms of open access uh, to data, um, so currently, uh, to be honest with you, Toronto District School Board has always been very open in terms of sharing their data, but obviously it's been done in broad strokes. Um, and we've relied on that data to um, you know, start some of our own equity programs as well. So obviously that data will be available to other people in terms of digging down and getting really kind of really deep. Um, those are still some conversations that uh, we'll need to have and make sure that um, we're being respectful to our communities and our kids. Um, and that obviously will probably involve a legal opinion to make sure that um, how deep we can share data outside of our school board. Okay, let's move on to other questions. The other mic. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my Your name, name is yeah. my name is Sonia Hernandez, and I am a registered early child educator with actually York Region District School Board. Um, it's not so much as a question as um, I'm, I'm reflecting on the panel and how they have asked, first of all, from Mr. Mohammed, um, who are we? And I, I and I, it's, I want to reiterate how important it is that, that I say that I'm a registered early child educator. And the reason being is because, um, and I'm very nervous right now, because this is the first time, I'm, I, and, and I'm thinking about Mr. Roach, who said, you need to speak up, you need to voice, right? So last year, um, all ministry, the Ministry of Education had sent all boards um, a mandate saying that uh, an, an ed, um, educational development instrument needed to be um, done on senior kindergarten children. And um, now, ministry says that we are partners with the teachers, you know, but many times talking with colleagues, um, not just with York Region, but in other boards as well, you know, that's not always the case. There's no equal respect. Voices are not being heard, specifically registered early child educator voices. And only teachers were invited to do this, this survey. Um, and so I think this is one of the reasons why I came here, because whose voice counts, really? I, I see myself as a partner to my teacher partner. I see myself as an equal partner, but not a lot of people see that. And I just ask that ministry, if you work for the ministry or, or if you are a leader in the board, that you somehow um, support that relationship. Because right now, as early child educators, we don't have a lot of support. Um, we're scattered all over. We work for many different organizations. Um, and, and we're struggling to, to be heard. We belong to a college, right. the College of Early Child Educators. We have to be accountable every year. I have to make sure that whatever I say, whatever I do, and how I do my work, that it is upheld and that it is respected. And, and, and I'm having a hard time <laughs> with that. Thank, thank you for so your comment. Uh, as a past uh, kindergarten superintendent, I, I know about the problem and I think we all have a sense of it and we're all working to make that situation uh, better. But thank you for your question and we'll leave it to the panel to uh, respond to in a minute. Uh, let's have Allison, uh, one more question from that side of the mic and maybe one, one from here. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my question is really around the, the narrative of the data. So as somebody who works with Toronto District School Board, I think I'm really grateful that we have the data. I use it all the time. I'm happy all the boards are collecting it. But I think one of the challenges is the narrative that staff, principals, teachers begin to form around the data that re-stigmatizes particular populations where they blame the students or the single parent fan, all the rest of it. So I guess my question is, do you have a definitive strategy around how you're framing the narrative of the data so that you help administrators and staff to understand it and not think of it with respect to a deficit model? Great, thank you, Allison. Great question. And the final question of this round. Thanks. Al Allison and I are on the same wavelength here. I'm uh, Judith Kramer. I'm a proud principal of the Tro in the Toronto District School Board. And uh, this question I have is related to Allison's question and kind of feeds off of Michelle's comment of one key piece, we're collecting this data. Are we ready to receive the information from this data and act on this? So that's the piece of I'm always looking for strategies, ideas, or maybe what you're putting into place to act, any of the panelists, to act on, so now we have this data, what are we going to do about it kind of thing, and how do we support those teachers and the people right there on the front line who are working with it every day? Okay, great. I think Mo wants uh, the first shot at this, so Mo. Great, great. So um, to respond to the first speaker, and that comes back to that, that conversation around what knowledge is value, and, and we really need to think a little bit very deeply around 
what knowledge is valued because our, our registered early childhood educators do bring a stream of knowledge that needs to be valued and needs to be part of the conversation. And that speaks to what uh, Allison said, um, Allison, right? Yes. In her statement, um, you know, what strategies do we have to repeat to not repeat the patterns of achievement that we're seeing? And that comes back to the notion of who is sitting at the table looking at that data. You know, who do we have that is going to bring an asset-based narrative into the conversation to challenge and ask questions when we see certain things to be able to look beyond the um, paradigms, if you want to call it, of the past and say, well, hold on a second. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look around inclusion or the inclusive environment in the classroom and see what are the conditions for success that have been set up to begin with. And let's really reflect a little bit on uh, uh, all of those pieces that have contributed to the um, challenges and the patterns of achievement that we're seeing as opposed to making um, blanket statements because the knowledge streams that we're using to apply to that lead us to think that certain students of color or certain students of certain backgrounds, socioeconomic status, are prone to patterns of poor achievement. So that's a, a very important um, disruption. Mm -hmm. Sure, I just want to say quickly, the data is fantastic, the data is great when we can get it, but it has to be coupled with professional development and equity specific professional development because in order to truly understand what the data is telling us, we need to have a base knowledge of what equity is, what privilege is, what bias is and how it plays out in our schools. Uh, because if you don't, then you do have those situations where the person who's marginalized is being blamed for the position, right? Like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that whole myth of meritocracy comes into play until people, unless people understand the structures. So I think professional development goes a long way along with the data. So just to build on that, um, that has been, I've been on exact question you asked, that's been my soapbox for the last year as we've been doing the student census data. Um, we have seen that, yeah, but stuff happen with our workforce census. And most recently, our workplace equity uh, manager, Farrell and I had presented um, some data on teachers who are racialized, who have been talking about you know, their experiences. And I sat in meetings where I heard um, senior team say, um, but these might be only people who came forward who have an issue, right? And as soon as you do that, you're devaluing the narrative, and then right away people shut down. Um, so Monday, <laughs> uh, we are starting our senior team all year. The focus on our own professional learning is going to be on how do we um, really keep our bias, I'm not going to say you can never be bias free, it's bias aware. Um, that you're going to keep your biases in check and when you're looking at the data, are you automatically looking at it through your privileged position? That is going to be the biggest issue and to be honest with you, it is the biggest challenge that we're going to face uh, because absolutely it could, we could be doing more um, harm and continuing the marginalization of some of our uh, most at risk uh, uh, students and, and communities. So um, that is where the rubber hits the road and that's where I believe the analysis of that data becomes important and that's why we need to work um, alongside community. And I just want to say around the ED, uh, EDI and stuff, I will tell you in Peel, the money only came for educators. We actually put money in so that um, ECEs would be involved. Okay, great. Um, now, uh, Cecil started the proceedings today and is ending the proceedings with this last comment and make it good, Cecil. Go. Oh, oh, oh boy, no, no, no pressure, no pressure. No pressure. I, I, you know, I mean, I'm a little bit jaded, I guess, when it comes to data and the narrative. I, I think I just want to get it done because we've been on this journey for so long, uh, particularly in our board. I just want to get it done. Uh, and you know, in terms of the narrative, I think it's important that we work as a board and as a senior team to control the narrative. I could remember being in a high school and, and the, the first report cards, the, the passing rate in calculus was like 48%. And, 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 and I thought there would be a lineup of parents at the door complaining because that's what would happen in another school that I was in. And, and because of the nature of the community, that didn't happen because that community just trusted the school. And, and so I said, look, look, I remember saying, look, here's my expectations. Passing rates have to be at least 75% in all classes, and if it's not, you have to have a conversation with me. It won't be an accusatory conversation. It'll be about what kind of support do we need to put into place to, to make sure that that happens. My God, everything, like, people went crazy. <laughs> they, they, you, you swear that I was starting a revolution. Um, but, but so the, the, the whole notion of, of, of controlling the narrative, I think it's important and it's no, something that I know we, we've been thinking about because we saw what happened in some communities when the data and, and uh, resulted in 
specific and deliberate intervention strategies, and those communities rebelled against those particular. But in, in Toronto, it was a Somali Canadian community that, that resisted this notion of, of, despite what the data was saying, where, where there were res, was resistance around the kinds of intervention strategies that, that we need. We, you know, and, and I'm not going to take the position that as, as educators we know everything and we know everything that's right. But it's important that we work at controlling the narrative. I, I think TDSB has done a great job in terms of how they release the data to the public and what the, 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 the accompanying pieces around the, the use of the data. Because I heard from communities, isn't that just going to stigmatize? And I heard from teachers, well, if I was in a particular community, then I will get different kids and of course the data is going to be better. So it, it, it's, it's critical, I think, that we control the narrative and we work on and, and work with communities and with experts such as Dr. James to talk about how we can control the narrative around the release of data. What a fantastic closing by Cecil <laughs> and opening too. Um, so I want uh, please join me in thanking our pa panelists. They were fantastic. <laughs> Vidya, do you want to say something? And also thank you to you, Jack for moderating. So folks, the discussion has started and here we go. We are excited to continue this discussion in our workshops that are gonna be happening from 11 to 12 today. So please, uh, please, uh, we'll, we'll take a quick refreshment break and then workshops begin promptly at 11. One more round of applause please for our panel and for Jack. <laughs> <laughs>